Hi, I am Justin Cochran, the CEO of Carbon Streaming Corporation. Carbon Streaming is a company that's 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 investing in climate projects around the world with an eye to provide capital to these projects to help fight climate change and then be a supplier of carbon credits to corporate buyers around the world. Justin, good to have you on the show. Thanks, thanks for coming on. It's fairly, like, it's fairly sort of nascent industry, and I think not too many people sort of understand it, but we certainly hear it most days. It's, it's, it's in the narrative. It's in the discussion, politicians and, and markets alike. So why don't we try and help people understand the, the market in which you are hoping to, well, you are operating in, but ho- hoping to kind of grow in. So what, what, how do you define it? Yeah, that's great, Matt, and, and thanks for having me on the on on the show. I think when, when we look at the global opportunity, I think it's worth sort of setting the scene, which is today the globe emits somewhere between 50 and 60 billion tons of carbon emissions. And the goal uh, over the next couple of decades is to take that down to net zero. And what net zero means is we will have somewhere between 10 and 20 billion tons of residual emissions that we just can't remove. But those are offset then by 10 to billion ton, 10 to 20 billion tons of, of carbon reduction projects that are act- actively removing carbon from the atmosphere. So, so net net, you're emitting 20 and you're removing 20. And it's those types of projects that that we at carbon streaming are looking to finance. And when you and again putting sort of money into perspective. This effort to reduce emissions from 60 billion to 20 billion tons is expected to cost about 10% of global GDP every year for the next couple of decades. You're talking about close to $10 trillion that needs to be spent every year. So it's just a, a massive opportunity. If you think about the oil and gas industry and the amount of money and opportunity that was created carbonizing this world, uh, it's equivalent, if not more, to decarbonize uh, this world. And that's the opportunity we're chasing. Okay, so the politicians are really behind this. You know, we, we've got the Paris Agreement. They're talking about, you know, net zero goals and, and, and targets. And the uh, yeah, everyone's behind it, which is great. But it needs to be regulated. And people need to actually understand, you know, what's real and what's not. Because, again, I think it's, I say it's a fairly nascent sector, but there'll be lots of new entrants trying to take advantage of all of this, um, all this demand and and, and money, uh, and some people are you know li- going to be a little bit more honest about it than, than others. So, in terms of that regulation component, um, what's it look like now, and what does it need to look like going forward? Yeah, what you see is is now sixty different um, you know regulatory systems around the world that are regulating carbon emissions. We do that in what we call the compliance market, where where we have cap and trade programs, for example, where where governments are reducing the amount of emissions every year that certain industries can emit. Um, the EU is by far the largest in the world that, that regulates emissions. Uh, in Canada, for example, we use a carbon tax that encourages the carbon tax goes up every year and that thereby encourages companies to reduce emissions. Otherwise, they, they have to pay the carbon tax. Um, and so you do have efforts you know, around the world from a when we think about heavy industry, the power and utilities sector, uh, heavy industrial emitters, there's efforts you know, globally now um, to, to reduce those emissions. At the same time, you have a system where, for example, in the US, the SEC is now looking at requiring companies to disclose their emission levels. And, and not only their direct, but also their indirect emission levels for, for people who are utilizing their, their products. And so what that means is you're, you're, you're forcing companies now to disclose and effect eventually, we believe, put a liability on their balance sheet that says these carbon emissions are a liability and they need to be abated over time. Um, all of those kind of regulatory incentives, if you will, regulatory oversight is what is putting a price on carbon and is what is de- developing this industry. Well, absolutely. Look, and, and, and the reason I'm sort of digging into this bit is around the thematic is that we've, we've had things like, you know, Dieselgate with, you know, v- VW, you know, an honest brand, apparently, who've been caught out, you know, 
not measuring things what we would call in, 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 a, in an honest way, right? So I'm trying to say, like, there's regulation, which um, in terms of the, the, the demand um, about the way the company should behave, there's the measurement of all of this, and then there's the kind of pricing component. So there, there's, there's a lot that needs to be understood for people to go, is this something which is people are honestly chasing and looking to, well, politicians are looking honestly and ch chasing to, and, and wanting to deliver in an honest way, or is it going to be something like ESG has kind of gone through over the last 18 months where the words mean something, but the industry kind of took advantage of it. Funds took advantage of it and, you know, rebadging and so forth. So how, how do we maintain integrity in this space? Yeah, and, and I, I think there's a really good point, Matt. I think that's the, what you have with the Paris Agreement and certainly with COP27, which we just got through in Egypt a, a week or so ago, um, is a global effort from all 193 company, countries sorry, that have signed up to the Paris Agreement to acknowledge that we need to get to net zero over time. Um, but the way that we've gotten you know, from the initial signing of the, the, the Paris Agreement 15 years ago to, to, to today is, frankly, we haven't made a lot of progress. Um, and, and, and certainly the energy concerns in Europe, you know, inflationary concerns is probably, you know, even delayed that. And, and, and you know, uh, every day that passes, you know, we're, we're, we're losing an opportunity, right, right to, to, to fight climate change. So I would, I would say what we saw in Egypt and continue to see every year with these, with these um, Paris Agreement meetings is a real effort to improve transparency, improve you know, improve the, you know, to level the playing field that everybody is, is using to disclose carbon emissions, to, to ensure that we are able to compare companies on an apples on to, to apples basis, to ensure there's more integrity to environmental claims, to carbon claims, to ESG claims. There are various task force forces underway, most of which are led by the UN, to try and bring this pricing transparency to create this this level playing field, um, I do we I do believe we will get there, Matt. Over time, uh, I think it's been frustrating for many in, in, in the sort of the slow progress that we make on an annual basis. Uh, certainly frustrating for me. Uh, I would be in that camp, but but we are making progress. I do believe this is going to take a couple of years to sort itself out. Still, um, but there is sort of interim targets for most of these countries targeting a 2030 um, you know interim reporting period as part of their their Paris agreement commitments there's going to be even more and more interest as we approach that date to, to make a meaningful you know contribution to, to, to reducing emissions right and we, we've seen sort of, we've seen politicians um, you know kind of create in an incentive environment, um, whether that be through tax breaks, and I think there's going to be some punitive measures taken as well against companies. But you know, in in a way, you know, companies like you make it easy for companies not to rush to fix their the problem in the in the first place. You know, it's their emissions that they're having to you know net off against some of the stuff that you're doing. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But do you think governments should also be like clamping down on on some of the technologies out there like if i look at mining i think we're moving we'll talk about moving to autonomous vehicles battery uh, driven vehicles um which which is which is good it, it stops a lot of emissions but there's some some big industries are going to find it easy just to basically take your product and buy themselves out of a hole aren't they well they're, they're so uh, i mean that's that's one of the reasons why we need higher carbon pricing Right. And, and we need more regulations. The, the, the carbon pricing today is just too low. One of our central theses, is, of course, is is on average, if you're buying a carbon credit today from one of our projects, you're paying somewhere between 10 and 15 dollars a credit on average. Um, the, the what, what is this credit unit? What, what is the credit unit? So, yeah, great question. So, so one credit represents one metric ton of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalents. Interesting. So okay. every carbon credit, whether it's a, in a compliance program, sort of regulated program, or what we tend to operate in is the, is the voluntary markets does represent that one metric ton of carbon. And so that one metric ton of carbon is only costing you 10 to $15 on average today if you're a corporation looking to offset those emissions. That cost needs to go to... 100 to 150, potentially even much higher over the next couple of decades to encourage 
to better encourage companies to reduce emissions. And then beyond, you know, if the reduction of those emissions costs costs three hundred or four hundred dollars a ton, then whatever they can't economically abate, then they buy credits to offset the balance. And that's where I when I when we started the conversation, I was talking about going from sixty to twenty. We need that higher carbon price to get us to those levels, encourage that reduction. And then, again, whatever is very expensive or impossible to, to, to abate, that's where these carbon projects and carbon credits will come in. Interesting. And then just a little bit more background on the market. So who are the biggest offenders, or should I say, who are the biggest buyers of, of uh, carbon credits today, and who is it likely to be? So the biggest buyers historically have been, I'd put them in three buckets the the energy um, companies, so the oil and gas producers, the airlines, and then the technology industry. And the te- technology industry actually doesn't tend to be a big emitter, but they tend to be on the leading edge of, of supporting industries like this. Um, I think over time, of course, we want to see this brought into just about every corporate buyer. Consumer brands are start, are starting to be a fairly substantial buyer as well as they're starting to package these credits along with their with their you know their consumer product to say we are now producing a carbon neutral bottle of water a carbon neutral t-shirt a carbon neutral car vehicle right those are right. those even beyond you know producing an electric vehicle those right. are the types of buyers that we're starting okay. to see coming in as and well. as, as, as we said earlier it's it's, a, it's imperative that someone is there to say that that's just not a claim. That that's a that's a reality. So I think that's really really important um, to, to um, f- for the retail for for the public to actually feel it is is true. Um, with regards to um, it, again the the types of businesses which um, you would be going after in terms of you you, you would be going and talking to, I guess the defence is saying well actually. It's a kind of guideline. It's an aspiration. It's not mandatory yet. When does it become mandatory? When do these companies actually have to get on with the job of, of um, dealing with a kind of net zero commitment? Well, it's it's funny. We do call you know um, our market the, again that we're focused on the, uh, as the voluntary carbon market. But but remember, a lot of these are commitments that these companies have made, and once the company makes a commitment. It's very hard to walk away from that commitment. So it doesn't, you know, especially with with the regulatory uh, pressure, with shareholder pressure, with with consumer pressures. Um, so we now have seven thousand companies worldwide that have committed to being net zero. By that, by the way, that's a twenty five percent increase year on year from where we were last year. So despite market volatility, despite these energy concerns, we still see this. Well, well, I wonder, I wonder what that is in terms of the total size of the market. I mean, seven thousand is not twenty-five percent increase from a low base doesn't mean anything. So, in terms of uh, what pressure will the government, will governments, will the UN, will whichever body start putting on these companies to actually play ball and play their part? Right, and and that's what we're starting to see with the SEC now, as I as I discussed earlier, starting to require there's there's draft rules that we're going to require disclosure of these of these carbon emissions. I do think. Sometime, Matt. Certainly, before twenty before twenty thirty, as I said, that was that's sort of your first reporting deadline as part of the Paris Agreement. I certainly think before that date, and probably well before that date, we're going to be putting carbon emissions as a liability on the balance sheet of these public companies. To give you a sense, again, those that seven hundred that seven thousand companies does represent over fifty percent of the market for those for 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 companies that have have committed to net zero. So it, it has become a pretty, again, we're talking about public companies, a uh, pretty meaningful um, now, but pretty meaningful number now are committing to net zero. But your re- governments um, are going to start creating a liability here. Um, and we do expect that to happen over the next five years, I would say. What an awesome tax regime that's going to be for most governments. That's just, they must be <laughs> rubbing their hands. Okay, yeah, well, so that's going to happen. Yeah, no question. <laughs> it's going to happen. No question. Okay. Well, look, um, 
there's a, I'm sure there's another four hours of conversation to be had around, had around that. But um, to, for the sake of the listeners, let's kind of dive into a little bit about you. Um, you personally, what, what's, what's your background? You know, what, what, why have you ended up here? So, so my background is is in finance. I've been in the royalty and stream financing business for for the the bulk of my career as a principal investor for the last 15 years. Um, so I love this model, which we utilize here at Carbon Streaming, of, in, of, of investing in projects, investing in companies, using this royalty and streaming business model. Um, I've personally myself raised and invested billions of dollars um, in this space, truly believe that you can take this business model and apply it just to, to just about any commodity in the world. Um, so I saw the opportunity along with my partners three years ago to, to do this in carbon. We were the first company in the world to publicly list uh, a carbon trading investment um, company that was financing these projects. And, uh, and we see just tremendous opportunity to, con- to, to, continue, to conti- continue doing that. Fantastic. Okay. So you, um, you, you, were, you were first to market. You got an amazing pop um, out of the gate in terms of the share price, et cetera. It's going to kind of the, – the, the, it, it's all – would levelized, equalized? I'm not quite sure how you want to frame frame it, but you sort of back back down to um, levels that probably a bit more commensurate with the multiple on on you know re- revenues, etc. So, t- so tell us about now the initial excitement is over. How does this company go on and grow? Where's the revenue come from? What are the markets that you're chasing? Yeah, absolutely. So we we did come sort of roaring out of the gate as you as you indicated, Matt. We've we've come back a lot over the course of this year. Frankly, today we're trading close to our cash value. In fact, I think today we're actually less than our cash value on our on our balance sheet, despite you know having uh, having invested in 21 projects now around the world. Um, I I would I would uh, equate that to some to to just a first mover advantage out of the gates, and now you know the first mover disadvantage is people are sort of waiting to see us prove that the business model can work, and that's what 20. 23 is going to be is going to be about we we are expecting in 2023 the majority of our projects to start delivering credits to carbon streaming as credits are delivered to us we sell and monetize those credits to corporate buyers around the world so we'll start to be able to generate significant revenue significant cash flow be able to again prove to our investors that the model works and they'll start to be able to look at us as you know, and value us on a on a revenue and cash flow basis. Um, that's the, the that's the hope, uh, and certainly my strong belief in twenty twenty three. Fantastic. So, g- give us a sense of what what do these things look like? Because again, if you, if I'm looking looking into this sector, there's going to be some great stuff, really fantastic stuff, which really does good. There'll be others, I think, less so, where which are just maybe trying to take advantage of the ecosystem that's being created here. So, for you, what what what, what does good look like in terms of the products? Yeah, so- so to, to give you a sense of, of what the product looks like, we would invest at Carbon Streaming, we would invest on average 10 to $20 million into a, a project somewhere around the world. We now have 21 projects in 12 countries, seven different project types. Uh, and so when I talk about project types, think about methane avoidance projects, forest conservation projects. Uh, reforestation projects, biochar, so um, these amazing cook stoves and water filtration projects in in Africa. So those are the types of projects we finance. And the way we finance it is we provide the capital and we get the carbon credits for the life of those projects in return. And some of these lives are 10, 20, 30, 40, in some cases, 100 years. Um, And so we get delivery of these carbon credits. We then would monetize those carbon credits to these corporate buyers, as I indicated, and we keep a share of the revenue. So what does success look like for us? Success looks like uh, for us is when we start getting those, those, these carbon credits delivered to us, and they tend to be delivered on an annual basis. We then are monetizing and, and today believe we can monetize these credits at much higher prices than we use in our valuation models. And we can earn, in, in, many, in some cases, a four, five, six-year payback on our invested capital and, and, have a, and still have a stream for 20, 30, 40 years, as I indicated. 
Well, let's look, let's look at that. It's really important that people understand this because, again, a bunch of questions sent in to me made me realize that people are a little bit nervous off the back of this kind of crypto stuff that's gone on for the last two, three weeks, right? You know, it, it, people were likening this to that. And I'm like, well, no, it's not quite that. But I can sort of see the confusion because it doesn't feel tangible as such, unless you go and look at some of the investments you've made, like you know, these kind of cook stove type things in, in, in Africa you mentioned um, there and the reforestation type stuff. So how do, how, do you, how do you decide which projects meet your criteria? And in which case, describe your criteria, please. Yeah, um, and definitely. then more importantly, um, the, I understand the kind of payback component, which is, which is, which is awesome. I, you know, most businesses will be pleased with that kind of profile. Um, but, you know, then what do you kind of just keep reinvesting this so in mining terms, plow the money back in the ground? Or is there some kind of other way that your shareholders can benefit from, you know, your financial success? Yeah, absolutely. So great, great questions. When, when we are looking at, at the project, so first from a how do we select the project, um, you know, parties that we, we are partnering with, the biggest thing we focus on is quality. And, and so um, we are looking for, for obviously a diversified portfolio, globally diversified portfolio around, you know, different countries and geographies and, and project types. But we are looking to partner with what we believe is only the highest quality carbon project developers around the world. What does that mean? It means these are these are project developers that have done this for many, many years, and in some cases decades, and proven that they know how to, how to develop a project and develop a very high quality credit. The, you know, one of the questions around some credits in this industry are some are deemed higher quality than others. And you certainly, from a corporate buyer perspective, have a big focus on ensuring they're only buying the highest quality credits. Those are the ones that we want to be in our portfolio, of course. Um, and 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 when we and and what does a high quality credit mean? It means that it's high integrity. It's past third party audits. Um, it is what we call this concept of of truly additional to to what would have occurred in a base case. So you are truly reducing global emissions or you're removing emissions from the atmosphere and we get that audited um, third party audited significant diligence we send people to to site we hire third party consultants to help us review those projects so first thing is making sure these projects we're supporting are extremely high quality once as you indicated they start generating and delivering credits and we're generating cash flow from these investments we then really have two options we can reinvest that capital into new investments. And certainly in the early days of the company, you would see the majority of that free cash flow going into reinvestment into new projects. Eventually, of course, you get enough projects and enough free cash flow that you can start paying a dividend. When you look at the mining royalty and streaming companies, they're all paying you know, meaningful dividends. A fair amount of their cash flow out is as dividends. And again, continuing to reinvest the rest into the business. Right. Okay. Okay. It, it, so, do you think there's a kind of? Um, I always talk about bifurcated markets, but do, but in terms of the different qualities of credits, some are going to be able to be sold for more because they meet certain criteria, and and others less so. So, your Googles, your Qantases, you know, your kind of premium brands are going to want these kind of better quality um, credits for sure. So, they they pay how much more than the sort of you know, lesser credit? <laughs> it's a great, it's a great question, Matt. And this is going to, you know, some of these numbers might shock you, but, but uh, in terms of well, what's the value of a low quality credit right now, it's around $3 a credit. What's right. the value of a high quality credit? In some cases, some of these tech firms are buying credits for over a thousand dollars a credit. Um, and so you have a pretty big spread on average, as I indicated earlier, somewhere in that 10 to $15 range on average. So there's far more, you know, average to lower quality credits than there are these extremely high quality credits. Um, but the value is, is dependent on, on how the credit is generated. So these high value credits are generally coming from these large industrial, what we call direct air carbon capture projects, where you have these massive fans that are actually pulling 
air and carbon out of the atmosphere, passing that through a membrane where the carbon is captured and then and then create and then c- converted into a solid and and stored underground. And that is a very one energy intensive, which of course they are using renewable energy, but uh, it very it very expensive. These are billion dollar projects, right? Pulling only a small amount of carbon out of the atmosphere every year. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Matt. I can yeah, see no, you okay, that, that, yeah. that, that, that kind of salute. I know seeing, seeing those, and I think they, they make the headlines, right? But they, they, it seems yeah. kind of in, insane to me, but <laughs> I, I know nothing. Um, whereas you kind of at the other end of the spectrum, we've also had, you know, companies with these huge kind of large sulfide ore bodies, mining companies going, hey, well, I'll tell you what, once we put it on the surface here, throw some water on this stuff, these rocks absorb um, Naturally carbon, absorb right? carbon. And it's like, yeah. and I, as I, if I was looking in, you're going, are you kidding me? It's kind of like you're you're going to generate revenue, probably more revenue than you do from mining, because of a process which naturally occurs anyway. You found a way of quantifying it. You will get you will sell those carbon credits. So that's two things there. One is kind of we're we're kind of creating a synthetic environment for something which already happens. And two, if that is allowed by the, the powers that be, you're saying those sorts of massive large mining projects could make the market awash with carbon credits. And, you know, as we know, scarcity is our friend, oversupply is not. What happens for companies like you if that, if, if, in that kind of scenario? Yeah, so so it, the, the, the scenario that you're talking about is – is when we look at the supply of credits, generally speaking, most people think of reforesting the planet, right? Creating carbon credits, not from not from rock sequestration through through mining projects, but through reforestation initiatives. The expectation that is that the, the demand would actually require you to reforest the planet like five times over. There, there's just not enough land and opportunity out there to reforest to generate enough credits. There, right now, this market is, is supplying um, and demanding around 300 to 400 million credits on an annual basis. The expectation that is that that's going to go to 10 to 20 billion that I mentioned um, by 2050, and certainly a billion to a billion and a half by 2030. Um, so this is still a market that where we see explosive demand growth. That's a lot of supply. There are thousands of projects that need to be created in order to generate that kind of supply. Um, so in fact, you know, longer term, as we look at at you know, estimates from from many of the research houses over over the next couple of decades, we see a massive undersupply of credits, not the not the reverse, which again is why we expect pricing to increase quite materially to get us to that point where we where we need ten to twenty billion tons of of, uh, of these carbon credits. Okay, in- interesting. That's a lot to lot to digest and lot lot to think about. So, Justin, twenty twenty three is your year. Just remind me again, what, what what are the kind of big moments for you that people should be paying attention to? So the big catalyst for us will be just uh, in- incremental news on our current uh, portfolio of projects. Again, 21 projects. We continue to see very, very good progress at every one of those projects. We're quite encouraged uh, by each of them. Um, and material sort of first deliveries of credit revenue and cash flow that's going to come from, from the delivery of those credits um, we think it's going to be a pretty exciting year uh, and certainly get us back to a point where we're trading materially above the capital that we've committed because we believe, strongly believe, the capital we've committed has been um, very accretive for shareholders and start to recognize the value in what we've done. We do have a first mover advantage. We've had, you know, we, we also, I think, are then the first company to experience some of those growing pains. We're, we know we're in a nascent industry. Um, but very, very excited about what the future has in store for the company.